So as an absolute massive fan of Microprose, titles such as F-19, Stealth Fighter, Gunship, F-15, Strike Eagle, I was absolutely thrilled recently to get the chance to speak with Wild Bill Steely, who was the CEO and co-founder of Microprose. I won't waffle on. Um, I hope you enjoy the conversation that I had with him. If you like what I do, thumbs up, subscribe. That's all really appreciated. And if you want to support me, there's a link in the description to buy me a coffee. Thanks very much, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you ever so much for joining me. I feel almost starstruck to get to meet you. You are you are yeah. this legend that's been floating around on my computers my since the my early eighties. My wife 80s. says I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> well, mine too. I've such a collection of Microprose games, and F nineteen is a game I still go to on a regular basis, and. I just thought... It's amazing how many people wanted me to put nuclear weapons in F-19. That sort of, like, defeats the objects, though, to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, it does, but I must have had 30 emails asking me why there weren't nuclear weapons. Really? <laughs> yeah, people are nuts when they like a game sometimes. The, 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 thing, the, thing, that, the, the, the thing is, though, it's, it's, it's a skill it's a skill game. You need to develop a skill to play the game properly and to get the most out of it. And you can't buy yourself through the game. You, yeah. the the manuals it comes with. I mean, it's it's a book. It <laughs> to play we the game properly. I remember yeah. back in the day playing F nineteen properly. And I was reading up on how the SAM sites worked and how to approach them without getting detected. Some of them you'd need to skirt round the edge. Some you need to fly directly towards and then directly away from. Yeah. And this was all in the manual. And it was... There was so I, I much want to, to it. I want, I want to credit one person for that. That's Arnold Hendrick, who's passed. And he was a game designer who wrote most all those big manuals. Brilliant guy. He helped us with everything from Strike Eagle on until about uh, when I left the company. Really, really, really good. Eye. And I've got on my website uh, uh, a, a uh, story of Arnold Hendrick. Uh, Arnold Hendrick. Well, credit and, uh, credit to him then because it made the game so immersive. Yeah. When you when when I was playing the games, I felt like I was there. I felt like I was there in my own little world, sat at my computer, and I was concentrating like hell not to be killed. And then <laughs> I would get killed, and I'd try a different tactic. And if that didn't work, I'd read back up on the manuals and, and see where I was going wrong, what I could do different. There was just so much to it. And without the manual, the, the, the game wouldn't make sense you could sure you could jump into it you could take off maybe i mean i got that out that's that's the that's the key bindings to 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 uh to work out what on earth you're pressing it it just, the, the just the amount of hours of of pleasure i've got from that and then of course there was always the mention of um this this illustrious uh Wild Bill Steely in all in all the manuals. <laughs> I was the best play tester we had. I just want you to know that. He was like, who who is this guy? And then I jumped on wherever it, wherever I've got it. I was looking back over this and I don't know if you recognize this guy. <laughs> yeah, he's still on my business card, by the way. <laughs> That was done by the artist at Microprose. So that was an artist at Microprose? Uh, I was, uh, and they gave that to me as a prize, a uh, present, one December. Uh, and I didn't know it was coming, but they did the whole thing. Because we used to have Christmas parties. Right. I, I thought all our staff were really good people. And uh, they wanted to give me something one year. 
So they decide that, uh, I don't know if you can see this. I can indeed. It's still there. Uh, it's yeah. still there on my business card. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I think it was, well, I, I see his name because I still talk to him periodically. You know, he's got four kids. He's a busy boy. Oh, I'll remember his name here in a minute. That's one of the things when you get to be my age, you start forgetting names. But as long as I remember why I'm going to the kitchen with my kick, uh, coffee cup, I'm ahead of the game. So every, everybody knows, everybody who knows yourself and Microprose, the background, will know that you had a, a career back in the U.S. Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel, and so on and so forth. How much of that do you think you brought into into Microprose micro and the and the games? I'll give about three quick stories for you. you ready? Uh, my dad survived World War II as a B seventeen and B twenty nine navigator. He went to Korea as an infantry officer and read a company. He can't come home and gets killed two years later by a drunk constant. I marched behind his caisson. You know what a caisson is? I don't. It's what, it's what the U.S. has. It's a horse-drawn wagon with a casket in it where you're in Arlington National Cemetery where you're going to bury your dad. And his company drove all the way from Ohio to Arlington, Washington, D.C., which is, you know, a six or seven or eight-hour trip. And they said, Bill, you come carry the guide on. I'm eight years old and I'm carrying the guide on. And I'm marching in step because I hung out with him a lot. I knew I was standing step. And that convinced me that I want to do what my dad did. I knew he wanted to be the pilot, not the navigator. So that's what uh, led me to my career. I originally joined the U.S. Army because I had a, some an Army deal where I could go to Vietnam as an infantry uh, officer after three years of schooling. And that's what I was going to do. And the next year, the Air Force said, would you rather go fly? I said, hmm, let me think about that for three nanoseconds. <laughs> So I went to the Academy, the Air Force Academy, which is now 5-0 and in football, which is a big deal for us, and uh, we're not that good. Uh, but anyway, I got to fly, and even if I had bad eyes, I memorized the eye chart. The flight you memorized said, Did you? Yeah, the flight surgeon says, did you memorize the eye chart? I go, well, certainly, sir. I wanted to pass. He goes, that's really smart. Take your glasses and go to pilot and check. And I went off pilot training, and I did very well in pilot training. I think it was six out of 54, and that was only because I busted one check ride for being too aggressive. Me? Aggressive? Come on. <laughs> so anyway, they kept me as a, a 37, T-37 IP, and then they gave me an F-4, and they changed the F-4 to C-5A, and I said, I don't want to be a transport pilot. I don't want to be an airline pilot. I don't want to be a fighter pilot. And so I left active duty, went back to school, and I went to the Air National Guard flying A-37s, O-2s and A-37s, two good airplanes. The A-37s is called the Dragonfly, which used, both of them were used in Southeast Asia. And I lost nine classmates in one month in Southeast Asia after we all just got there in 72. So I'm at the Guard, and we have started the company in 1982, and it's 83 and uh, we've got now 25 employees, and we're starting to, and I was really starting to sell Solo Fight, the second game that Sid did. It, the first, he did three at the beginning. Boy of the Jungle, if you've never seen it, it's quite a game. And he made it because I had three kids, and we had, you could use four joysticks and play against each other. I thought it was pretty innovative for Sid. Yeah. And he made uh, Floyd of the Jungle, Chopper Rescue, which I sold to CVS for 50 grand. That was a big deal for us back then. 50 grand seemed like a lot of money. And then there was Hellcat Ace. And that came because I was flying the A37. You've heard the story, I see. Yeah. And he said, and we were bored in a sales meeting, and he said, let's go try this game. And he beat me at it. Fighter pilots do not like to be beat or out bragged. He said, I can ride a better game in a week. And I said, if you can, I can sell it. Well, he helped me to that. And that's how we started the company in August of 82. But now it's uh, summer of 83, uh, maybe early 84, and uh, I'm flying my A-37 uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, north of Baltimore, where we were. And I follow a good friend of mine who was visiting me last year, 
Uh, I don't know if you know what a split S is. You roll and you pull. And I'm going about 400 knots, and I see the tree coming up. And I go 400 knots to the top of a very big tree, knocking branches on us. So I thought it was dead. And at that point, I said, well, we got 30 employees. I'm not going to make my living uh, you know, flying for the guard. I better make this company something. And that's when I left the guard and went to the Pentagon and served the Pentagon for five years. But almost everything I did was things I wanted to do from the uh, from my military experience. Sid didn't know what to make. He made solo flight because he knew I liked to fly. And then we got Arnold to come work with us, and we did it. Uh, F-15, gunship, silent service, M1 tank we do. Those were all my ideas. Uh, and, and then because I was serving the Pentagon, I saw all that stuff. In fact, I was pretty excited. The first day F-19 came out, guess why I'm so excited? Go on. The air, I'm there, I get there at eight, you know, six o'clock in the morning, and at seven o'clock, I hear that the Air Force is going to announce the stealth fighter today. I'm very excited. We go, where were they? Where was that? They ship with F 19. And you're that day, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> And it, well, the same day, we ship with F 19. And because Tom Clancy told me it was the F 19. You know who Tom Clancy is? Yes, I do. Famous did. novelist? Yeah. Well, he was a pseudo friend of Sid and I. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm going all excited. Yay. And I call the office and tell them, hey, guys, it's going to be a special announcement. Look for it. be out about 2 o'clock. And they're going, okay, what is it? I said, I can't tell you. And it comes out the F 170 day. My answer told me it was the F 19. <laughs> I noticed and, there, was, there was a change made on mine, and you could choose between the two aircraft. Well, that was, uh, and later we made F 117A, which was just F 19 with some improvements. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think each one of them sold over 10 million copies. That's pretty darn good when you're a little tiny company. And then, of course, in 86, we were selling gunship. And Trip Hawkins said anybody could sell gunship. <laughs> yeah. It's up there on the wall behind you. I see it. Got that there. Yep, and it's one up there on the wall, too. Look behind you. The F-19 yes, up different there. cover, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Sid said, just give me one more year, and I'll make this really great. I said, Sid, make it great, we'll make a new one next year. <laughs> and that's why I always had to push him and all the developers to make ones now, and we'll make a better explosion next year. Because I don't know about what you think, but programmers can always work on something forever if they're just no one sent them to finish. So we had a, a, a compensation program that paid them big bucks based on the first year sales, based on them shipping it in one October. Now, one, why one October, Simon? Do you know? Yeah. Why? I'm, why were we shipping them? I'm, I'm guessing because she owned that run up to Christmas. Well, if you ship on one October, you get a, a load in on one October, you get another load in on one November, if you get another one in one December. Right. So if you miss October, that's one third of your sales for the year gone. Yeah. So my guys can get twenty five percent of the first year sales if they ship the game by one October. So we're kind of slow in the beginning, a little fast in the middle, and hundred hours a week in the end because they wanted to buy Susie a new bicycle for Christmas. They wanted that bonus. So, so who, who, a lot of who made the decision then that games were ready to go? Who who made that who made that decision then? Yourself. Well, I tested I was always testing yeah. games with them. And uh, when we shipped Civilization, it failed. Why Why? why, so why? do you think that was? Because uh, we shipped 15,000, we got 14,000 back. And the reason was because people got stuck. And I went to the development group with the guys, and we all liked it. And this was after I had negotiated with Avalon Hill. It was really a board game from Avalon Hill. That said, quote unquote, borrowed. And I'm going to come back and tell you why, what we did with Civilization. But uh, we, and since I got this new game called Civilization, it shows to me, and I'm pretty excited. Everybody at Max Planet, we're pretty excited about it because it's his idea. We, I didn't have anything to do with that one. And then I get a call from Eric Todd, the president of Avalon Hill, and he says, Bob Bell, Sid's stealing my game. No. 
I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. We don't lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate anybody does. That's what we say to, but I know a couple of them that broke that code, but I don't try not to. So anyway, uh, I said, well, let's have lunch and talk about it. I bought him three martinis at lunch. He signed a little piece of paper that said, I put a uh, card in my games uh, uh, promoting his box game, and he did the same promoting my uh, computer game. And uh, of course, we this, I was uh, on the rec uh, committee at the Software Publishers Association, and I got Robin Williams to go to dinner with Sid and I. You remember the famous comic, right? Yeah, Robin yeah. Williams. And he uh, talked our ear off for an hour and a half. We were laughing and giggling. They talked for another hour because all he wanted for payment was free games. And I gave him civilization. And he told me, Bill, you need to put Sid's name on this. This is that good. And we did. And then he talked about it on television. So and, but how we went from getting 14000 back and selling another $2 million, and he says, uh, the guys in the back said, we get stuck. And I said, what do you do when you get stuck? So we go in Sid's office, what, ask him what to do next. And we were all sitting around. I said, why don't we just put Sid in the box? He said, what's Sid in the box? I said, make science advice, or military advice. I was playing the game too. And that's how Sid got to be the science advisor, the military advisor, the political advisor in the game. Right. And you were, so, you were chief play tester and salesman then? I was. And if anybody could beat me, they had trouble. Because <laughs> we'd keep going until we could beat them. <laughs> it made me think of that. I saw where you did an interview on Computer Chronicles. And I think you were sat with one of your friends from Spectrum Holobyte there. And who became president of Microprose, too, Gilman Louie. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it showed in the gameplay um, that you, you, your friend uh, was uh, was struggling a bit there, but you seemed to uh, <laughs> uh, really fly yeah. with it. it. Well, I was the real pilot. Chopsticks, as he called himself, was not. <laughs> Good guy. I'm going, Chopsticks? That's... Today that wouldn't be allowed. That's for sure. He, but that was his name. He called himself. Yeah. So, and he was a really good guy, and uh, we competed. And then another quick story: I sent him five hundred thousand dollars with my head shake once. That's a lot of money. With no contract. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Well, it's about two days where I was going to take my uh, my family and go to the Caribbean. He calls me and says, Bill, Bill, hi, Gilman, how are you? Because we've been competing and talking there, and so we knew each other pretty well. You know, we weren't buzz buddies, but we knew each other. Pretty well. He says, I need a half million dollars. I said, well, good luck. He says, no, no, I want you to sell, send it to me tomorrow. But what are you talking about, Gilman? He says, Robert Maxwell, you know who that was? I do, yes, the, uh, the media mogul. Went for a swim. We got thrown off his boat. Yeah, I went for a swim. Of a, well, they, I heard it was Mossad that did that because he was Jewish and they was anti-Semitic. Who knows? I don't know, but that's the story we were told. I said, Gilman, and why would I do anything like that? We don't have a contract, but I don't get anything out of it. He said, no, I'll give you uh, Falcon 3.0 for Europe. I said, well, that seems like a good deal. That's how we first shipped Falcon 3 in Europe. And uh, the whole Europe story is an interesting story, too, but I'm talking too much. Because the company, Microprose, just seemed to grow from strength to strength, didn't it? Year on year, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then yep, you've got... the way I wanted it. Then you've got offices in England and I think Europe as well. I had one in uh, where Bertelsmann is in Germany, and I had one in Paris where Thomas Mama <laughs> liked to show us around Paris. And my girls love going to Paris. And, and then I've got four daughters and one son. No, two sons. I forgot one of them. Uh, that one nice. Uh, I got them all in there now, six. And I took uh, my 16-year-old daughter, my biological daughter, not my bonus daughter, to England when she was 16. I bought her dresses and all that stuff. She walks around the shots that I say to him. With her high heels, and I go, I mean, strutting like I was a cool old guy with this young girl, and she keeps saying, Hi, Dad. 
<laughs> when we walk by them, she goes, Dad, that's so pretty. Just so everybody knows I was not, she was not my date. I took my two other girls there and they found an apartment I could rent for them for the summer. I went, hey girls, nice try. I think I'd never see them again. And they've all done well. They've all got college degrees. They all have grandbabies for us. So we did pretty well. So what were we talking about before that? I forgot something. I want to tell you about it. Um, we're talking about so we go on, sorry. We we started uh, we started our UK office because I was selling through Jeff Brown from uh uh what was the name of his company? I'll think of it in a minute. And, and he did a good job distributing for us. But he came to see me one day uh, when I was watching the World Cup in '86. Remember that was the magic hand by my yeah, friend yeah. against England? Was it against England? It was. I think I thought it was. So I'm in Maidenhead in a hotel, and he comes, he comes, Bill, Bill, come outside. I go, what? He says, come outside. I'm watching this game. He says, well, come on outside for a minute. I said, we're almost over. They're going to go into overtime or something. And uh, uh, they're finally over, and I know you guys were disappointed. And I go outside. He says, look what you bought me. And he had a Ferrari out there. He says, you bought this for me. I said, well, that was so nice of me. I didn't know I bought you anything because I was only getting 15% of his sales. And what was the name of Jeff Brown's company? Was it UK Famous Gold? Company. Yes. It, it, uh, yes, it, uh, it was. And uh, I started thinking about it. I said, why am I buying him a Ferrari? I'm just so driving Chevrolet. <laughs> and that's when I hired Stuart Bell to come uh, do the UK office and uh, I, I put an ad in a newspaper in the UK, and I was in some square there. can't remember the name of it now. And I was in the hotel, and people were slipping resumes under my door. And the, I put the ad, it says, uh, looking for a general manager who likes fast cars, fast women, and fast money to run a game company. So I was a little sexist there. I'm sorry. But I figured that'd get people's attention. And... Uh, had a great time, and Stuart Bell took some. Uh, he sent me his resume. Somehow he got it in, in, into me, and he walked in. He had all these resumes were the floor, and he picked them up because they were all you know by my door. He picked them up, threw them all the trash cans. Said, "You don't need anybody else but me." He now claims to be a, one of the founders of Mighty Pros. He was he was a founder of our UK office. How about that? Yeah, yeah, and and. Uh, U.S. Gold, I think it's called. It wasn't called U.K. Gold. U U.S. Gold, gold, that's it. Yeah, sorry. U.K. Yeah, gold was a TV channel. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds good, too. <laughs> so I walked into one of your famous uh, drugstores. You were selling games from your drugstore. I can't remember what one that was. Boots? So, what we've, I walked into Boots to see the buyer. And he says, the buyer's busy. He can't see you, although I had an appointment. I said, well, see those top 20 games up there on your wall? He says, Yes. I said, 10 of those are mine. I'll take them out of your stores tomorrow if you don't want to see them. What an evil sales that I am. I'm guessing, I'm the, guessing he saw you. <laughs> he did. And he said, Bill, these are so good, you don't have to go see the bill. He goes, go on to ship them to me directly. So basically, I hired Stuart to run the UK office, and he was putting them together over there. We'd send me software, he put them together over there, and we did very well. But he told me the software distribution camp was in Tech Berry. Yeah, tech -berry strange, strange choice for a head office, perhaps. And I and you know, and I said, okay. And I came back the next time, and I said, where's Tech Berry? He said, oh, it's a few miles that way. Where he picks me up at Heathrow, and it's two hours. We finally get to Tech Berry. They go, this is the software distribution camp of Europe. He says it will be because we're here. <laughs> So that's the guy that sales what he wants. So, and uh, we started with a small officer in Tedbury, I think in '86. And I think when we sold or, or when I left the company, we we had moved to somewhere else. I can't think of the name of that, but it was just 20 miles away. Because we had a warehouse outside of Tedbury, we had like 350 employees in that warehouse. So we had we had a big operation. And Princess I had a summer place not too far. And she'd come to the office and the girls would all go Google-eyed. And uh, she won games for guards. Wow, okay. <laughs> and there was a 
uh, some pig and cricket or something come there. And I walked in there one day and asked them after I knew the company knew that I was out of the company. I said, asked them if they knew uh, the Market Bros company. They're like we were in that town until they moved. And, and that's when I hired uh, Adrian Parr to come work for me. He was Boyd Weber's uh, financial officer and he came to be my MD. And he moved to someplace south. So anyway, I asked about uh, Michael Rose. They go, oh yeah, that Michael Rose, he owes us 200 uh, pounds. I went, I don't know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> but we did meet Sherlock Holmes in that pub. Oh, very good. I thought he was a fictional character. Well, he walked in with his cape and his funny hat and his pipe. And we were having like, sit with his girlfriend. He was 82. She was 55. Well, going, way to go, Sherlock. <laughs> he, he was some kind of famous artist. Ah. And we lived in Tetbury. And I didn't believe him. He says, well, why don't you come back to my house? And they had this beautiful cottage. The fireplace was bigger than my wall. And he's got a picture of him with the queen and the president. And he really was, I can't remember his name. I have to ask my sweetie again what his name was. And uh, he said, hey, well, you want to go see my paintings? I'm going, oh, okay. I went to see his painting. He offered me one for $30,000. I'm going, well, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. I just met this guy. He went to sell me something for thirty grand. I saw him later. It was selling for 500000 He was a student of Monet. Ah. And he really was good. But that's a little town. And you know what the big deal about the town was the wool races every May. <laughs> and the guys at Wait Race got the good-looking girls, they told us. What? Yeah, the British oh. do strange things, don't they? Like really chasing cheese and stuff. I don't know. Uh, it's they not put, something I've ever uh, seen. Sheep wool on their back and ran up a hill. Yeah, big sack of wool. Yeah. <laughs> a big sack of wool. And, and somehow that was fun, but it, it was a big celebration. But Tipperary was a nice place. We stayed at the close. I think Richard Branson want, uh, ended up buying that. And of course, I negotiated with Richard Branson for two days. Oh, I heard Richard Branson had some sort of interest in buying Microprose at one point. We sat in same square again, and he it was in my room for about two hours each day, and he offered me 50 grand, and we were doing eight and a half million. And I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I did a lot of good things, but a lot of mistakes. 50 and that was grand. one of them. Yep, and then he started Virgin Software, and he spent 200 million, and they came and went in about four years. Ouch. And I could have just retired, but I didn't want to retire. I was only 45 years old or 44. Or Sorry, did you say 50 like. grand they offered you? Oh, what, what did they offer you? 50 million. 50, 50 million. million. Right. And I'm sorry, 50 grand's wrong. But not enough zeros. <laughs> and we were only doing eight and a half million in revenue. But he thought our games were great. He could make new ones and all that stuff. And I turned it down. Do you think that was a mistake? Absolutely, positively overnight. I couldn't start another company, probably again, which I did. But that's a different story. So how how was then, it running uh, all these operations all over the world? Then what what did each what did each bit do? Then did they all do their own game developments? Uh, only the UK did their own game development. Right. Because uh, Stuart always wanted to buy somebody, and Adrian did buy uh, Rainbird. BT, company. yep, yeah, and they brought us a couple games. And then some lady many years later said we were good friends, and we had dated a few times. It turns out it was completely high. And she she was doing a, a, a TV show for BBC, and they came to me and said, "This lady said she was a very good friend." I met her once when I walked through the office, right. and, and she was claiming that we had an item. And she was claiming that her wife was handing out no legs, no arms, and all this weird stuff. And, and BBC was doing a whole thing on her, and then uh, just quit. You know, they, they called me, and I said, I don't know this person from Diddle, but she was a, 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 a Rainbird person. Yeah. Well, what was the idea with Rainbird then? Was that, was that just to. Uh... By the well, they had a couple of games stuff. that, no, we had Microprose, we had Microplay. And Microplay was those that were not done by my internal staff. They once, and one of the best ones was XCOM. Yeah. That came from a, some student 
the programmers at the University of Texas. And I really did never played XCOM because that wasn't my kind of game. I played the military games. I played Civilization. I played Railroad Tycoon. Uh, but basically, uh, XCOM didn't do it for me, but it did very well for the company. There's no doubt about it. Because I made a mistake. I was offered the first Nintendo license from the Japanese because I went all the way to Japan to speak about distribution. And I went, let me get this straight. I have to pay you a million dollars for 100,000 cartridges. Or I, I can, for a million dollars, make three new games and uh, have a total cost of $1.12 with my paper boxes. And I didn't see it. I started the coin out business. That was a bad business for me. For us, we spent $12 million and made $12 million in revenue. Yeah. It so wasn't very was ever done with Nintendo then. No, but uh, Sega, I did something with because I went to see Mr. Nakayama in uh, Japan. And he was sitting there for four hours. All, a couple of those guys were translating for him and me, supposedly. How, how did the guys... likes of. I don't, know, I don't know if you remember MicroStyle. I don't remember that one. Who did that one? Who developed it? I believe that was, that was a subsidiary of uh, MicroProse. There, there was. There was the likes of Stunt Car Racer, RVF. I think uh, oh, I think those were done in the UK. Yes. Yeah, I think so. And that, that was all Adrian Parr and Stewart right. talking to these people and yeah. trying to be big, big wigs. And they got some good ones for us. Uh, the the uh, famous guy who did a bunch of racing games and he did a really good one for it. It went for a long time, but it was a Local area network game. We'd sit in the office. We could all play against each other. And I was pissed when I lost her. <laughs> but we had a great time. What was that called? I have to look that one up. It was a great game. It sold very well for it. That was the best one that came out of the UK. What you uh, mentioned that the the focus really was sort of like military simulations or strategy games. And I'm with and I'm to get I'm the one bringing the first ideas. Yes. This this was the first game that I got from Microprose. Do you, do you remember that? Yeah, written by a guy who had been in the industry out west, and he it was down here in the Triangle in Chapel Hill, you know, about 30 miles from where we were. I can't remember Mike's full name. He's a good guy, uh, but he did that one based on my request because I wanted to buy a BD-5. Yeah. And no no guns or bombs in that one. No, but it was a great airplane. They raced them. And I remember, I, you know, it didn't last very long, but I figured that's for me, a BD-5, my own jet fighter, man. And that's how he built that game after I said I was looking for it. And he said, well, I could do that for you. <laughs> Mike Denman was his name. Yep, yeah, that's it. And I, so what do you think? What, what do you... How do you think Microprose became so successful? What 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 was what was the key thing that made them do so well? What what do you think that was? We had good people. We had ideas they implemented very well. Uh, we only had two games that didn't do as well as they should have: Darklands and. Uh, but everybody now, I walked into a, a air show and somebody had a Darklands T-shirt on. It told me it was the best game ever. That was what Arnold Hendrick wanted to do. And then we did Rex Nebular and a Cosmic Gender Bender. <laughs> we, we were competing with Sierra Online. And, and Kenny Williams was a good friend of mine. And he showed me the bathtub. He and his wife took the picture. And for their first game, they had them naked in the tub. <laughs> but, <laughs> nice, Kenny. And a uh, great story about Kenny. He was told by his venture capitalist that they were going to come arrest him. He says, good. The sheriff's my brother-in-law. I don't think he'll even get into town. <laughs> and that's how they never came after Kenny. <laughs> that was uh, Sierra Online. I was going to tell you the uh, Sega story, though. Yes. I don't know. Uh, so Trip Hawkins came to me and said, Bill, let's reverse engineer the Sega Genesis. And, and I'll do the sports games. You do the military games. And we'll do it together. And you only have to give me a million dollars. Another million dollars? Everybody wants a million dollars. Oh, Gilman only wanted a half million. And we were we had the money at the time. 
Uh, and uh, Sega decided to sue Trip. And uh, and it's, Trip came back and said, I'm getting sued by Sega. I said, why don't I call Ms. Nakayama-san and get you two on the phone? So I you know that uh, EA got away with paying half the royalties to Sega because I got him on the phone and was helping them negotiate that thing. So I helped him. I made no money out of the deal, but I, was pretty, I thought it was pretty good that I helped him. I don't know if Trip remembers that because he was going to get sued for big money. And, but Nakayama son stole our chip from Market Pro's coin out games. And you can see F15 Strike Eagle up there, that's what the coin out game looked like, too. Really? You've never, see, you've never seen that. It was the first 3D golf game, I mean, flying game ever out. Yeah. In that because Sid and I played Red Baron, as you know that story, right? Yeah. And it was all line draw. That's why Sid did silent and uh, it's sort of like because he saw the line draw there and learned how to do it for himself. Yeah. So um, and I don't know if you know, it took me almost two years to get Sid to leave General Instrument and come to work. And he only did it part time at home. Yeah, you were working full time and he was sort of like doing stuff on an evening. Yeah, well, I'm the one that had to hop my car. I yeah, heard three about that. <laughs> you heard about that? Yeah. Uh, you had to I, sell had Volvo, three, was it? <laughs> I had to hawk it. I didn't sell it. Right. I took it a loan out on it, and because we had twenty-seven dollars in re, uh, revenue in July, we had three employees. Wow. So I, uh, and we released so, uh, and we went to a trade show, and a company called Hessware offered us uh, uh, two hundred fifty thousand for the rights to ship solar fire. Said, that's big box. Why don't we consider that? And uh, as I'm walking out of the room, he, he said, I heard you don't want to give away the family jewels. Well, damn, Sid. I mean, he never said a lot, but when he said something, he better listen because he's smart as a whip. Uh, and uh, I said, okay. And that's where I went bankrupt about two weeks later. Wow. And, and I took so. Dodged. Yeah. Well, there's one good one. Thank you, Sid. And uh, I went to Sears and sold 25,000 copies of it. So how, 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 how come you'd gone from being, as you put it, quite, quite fluid with cash, quite cash rich, to... Oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, Solar Flight was the beginning. Okay, that's how, that was our first real big seller other than right. the uh, Chopper Rescue that we got right. 50,000 for it. Hellcat Ace would do really well when I was there showing them how to do it. Hellcat Ace was our first sale. I sold, I went to a computer store. I was going back and forth to New York from Baltimore for General Instrument. And I got off the train one night because I heard the computer store right there. Train station. And I said, it's like 10 to 9. And I'm sitting there. And the guy said, sir, we're closing. I said, well, I just got this game I want to show you. He said, sir, we don't need any of the games. We had a whole bunch on the shelf. I said, let me just show you mine. We sat there and played for two and a half hours. And he was really enjoying himself. And he said, okay, I'll take a hundred. Well, that's going to be impossible. I've got two. I've got one since got one. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says to me, you know, I'm a retailer. I said, okay, good. And he said, what price do you want to give me? I looked up, everything's twenty nine ninety five. I said, twenty nine ninety five. He said, you don't understand, I get 50% off. <laughs> 50%? <laughs> so I had to go tell Sid to get the kid next door to take two Atari drives, who was still the Atari 800, and go flip, flip between the drives, and he made another 100. So now we had 102 of them. And uh, we put an ad in Antique Magazine, and uh, I'd come home from work, and go on the phone and start calling computer stores and ask them if I could uh, buy Hellcat Ace. And they go, oh, I do that three weeks in a row. And the fourth week, I, and they tell me, no, they had never heard of such a game. I said, don't oh, see the ads in Antic Magazine. Fourth week, I go out to Instant John Stanton. I'm like, oh, sorry, this game called Hellcat Ace. I said, go ahead and get lots of calls about it. They call me. <laughs> and then in December of 82, I get called from the distributor. He said, I'd like 500 Hellcat Ace. I'm going, what? And he was a distributor in the game industry at the time. 
And I said, well, we can do that. And uh, I'm charging $17.95. He goes, no, that's a re retailer's price. I get $14.95. And I get credit. I said, credit? We never gave my credit before. You had to pay or you didn't get nothing. <laughs> and he goes, you don't know anything about retail distribution, do you? And I said, no. He said, well, let me teach him. And he had, his, uh, he had a quite a venture firm up in New England. And he and I worked together for about 10 years. He did a great job teaching me how to do it. And he shipped a lot of our games. And he did a really good job. So really thankful to Jerry. And I think it was the last thing we get. Nate and I are not going well in this So we got, and then I hired a guy that was so old. He was twice as old as me. He was, he called himself Barbar, uh, Barbar Ass. I think it was really Barbar Ass. <laughs> and he was 63 years old, but he knew sales. He knew the houseware reps. That's how we sold. I don't know if you have houseware reps in the UK, but they represent houseware products to all the big stores. So if you got a new plate or new utensils or new glasses or dishes, they would go in and say, here's our new line and try and sell Sears because uh, the dish guys didn't want to have individual salesmen going out of the country. And they got like a 15% commission. For the deal. So he, he, he started us in the houseware thing, and that's, Atari was doing the same thing uh, when they were selling games. And um, interesting enough, the same year we launched Microbros, I think it was the same year, it might have been 83, Atari went bankrupt. I had 10 copies of the Superman cartridge on order, and they made so many cartridges, they buried half of them in the desk because they sold them, they'd have to pay, uh, 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 pay royalties on it. So, oh well, <laughs> this is for the Atari BCS machine. How, how, how did piracy affect Microprose, do you think? Certainly, well, I met a lot of people. I met a lot of people around the world. Said, "Oh, I sold your game." And then I'm, I'm on a. I've got my granddaughter, who's now 13, and a beautiful young lady, ballerina, and she's like eight. And we're uh, at an airfield, uh, air show. And I said, uh, "Granddaughter, come over here. This is an airplane, Granddad flew the C5A Galaxy. You know what that is, right? Yeah, giant airplane. So C5A." I said, let's go up in it, and I'll show you the airplane. That's the granddad flew it for two years. And we get up there, and the sergeant is guarding the door. Well, let's go upstairs, because it's an upstairs and a downstairs. And he goes, I'm sorry, sir, you can't go up there. I said, I flew this airplane. In fact, it's very number at Dover. He said, well, I'm sorry, sir, we're not letting these be in something. I said, I'm tired of it. Sorry, sir, you won't do it. I said, well, you know, I make airplane games. He said, which one did you make? I said, F-19 Stealth Fighter. He says, I took that one out of your garbage, sir. The sergeant of the Air Force who lived in the Towson area, and he would, he used to go in our garbage can to get all the discs we'd throw away. He had all our games from our garbage can. He said, I'm really sorry, sir. And I'm still friends with him on Facebook. He was taking our games out of the garbage can. That's how he got F-19. <laughs> so piracy was big. I've gone around the world, and somebody will tell me, oh, yeah, I got a bootleg copy of that. I'm going, Thanks. Is this, I get six. Is this people then with just the discs or is the manual with a manual's bootleg? No, no, they were just the discs. Or the six discs, depending on how many we had in the box. Because that really surprises me because the manuals to me were so integral with your software. But these people didn't care. They were just sitting anything they could get for free. And the bigger problem was Apple was so expensive that those people traded the game around. That's what was my experience. Now they're not bad people, but again, you know, they, and they didn't know I had to pay the programmers and the artists and the developers and the marketing and all that stuff. Or they didn't care about it too. So when we go on cruises, I ask them, hey, guy, uh, the cruise director, have you ever play computer games? He says, yes. I go, you ever play F-15 Strike People or Civilization? He goes, I love both of those. He says, here's free drinks for the cruise. <laughs> 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 That's my chief advisor, good friend, former Army Nike guy. Ah. And are you a golfer at all, Simon? I used to play golf many years ago. I even went to the trouble of having lessons, and I had my own set of clubs that I spent a lot of money on. And to cut a long story short, um, I couldn't hit a ball to save my life. 
even even after having many lessons. That's really sad, Simon. <laughs> see that? I see that. Wow. <laughs> because I met my current wife, and she's my girlfriend for about a year and a half. And she'd come up to, because I owned a soccer team. You knew that, right? Yeah. And she, I'd fly her up from Florida, so we'd go to the soccer game. She'd spend the weekend with her. Uh, where did that story go on? I forgot what I was talking about. Anyway, uh, and that's where the soccer team was. That's where it left us on the but I started but after she would come up and I'd play basketball with young guys, which I did in the Air Force too, in a college and high school. Uh, and I'd always get hurt. I mean, you play with 20 year olds and I'm 45, almost 50 years old. And she said, enough for that. Get better at golf. And I started getting better at golf. And I, after I sold my quarters, I must have gone to golf school 10 times. Uh, and I went from really crappy to Winning the club championship here eight times, so too I much time. Too much time on your hands, perhaps. Uh, no, I like to win. Let's be very clear. <laughs> I like to win. So if I do something bad, I go practice it twenty-two times, so I can do it better next time. I do practice. My my theory in life: never give up. Life's too short. Enjoy every minute of it if you can. So, so go on. Sorry. I don't think of any more Margaret Pro story. I told you about Nintendo. I told you about uh, Richard Branson. I yeah. told you about uh, and, uh, um, Trip Hawkins and I. Oh, I didn't tell you about Activision. You want to hear about uh, Activision? Well, I was good friends with the guy who was running Activision. In fact, the previous guy who was running Activision, uh, we were at a trade show, and they had a big presentation at Caesars. And I knew he was staying you know, uh, right across the street. And he had the limo pick him up to go over the street. I said, Mike, you're a little excessive. He's still a friend of mine. He's 83 years old, and he used to run Activision. And he said, my investors expect it. And he was fired <laughs> two days later. So anyway, and uh, then this new friend, new guy came in. I knew him, and I was friends with him. And... Uh, um, I went to see him because he wanted to see if we could get together and do something together. And we're negotiating, and uh, we're on the second day of negotiation. He gets called out of his office. and said, Bill, we have to stop that. So what's going on? He said, he was just sued for $7 million for a patent violation, and we just can't do anything. And then he went bankrupt like three days later. They're bankruptcy. So Activision went bankrupt on me. Uh, <laughs> so you have to be careful in the game industry. And that's what I was worried about at the end of Microprose, too. Microsoft, my, Microprose got to be absolutely massive, didn't it? You've got... 43 million is not massive, but we had a lot of good games. It, it, massive, massive, massive to me. Massive to, uh, to, to, uh, to a lot of software companies out there. You've got, yeah. office, you've got offices in, in Europe. You're doing incredibly well. And offices in Japan, too, in Tokyo. And then it seems like almost out of nowhere, it, it just suddenly went into decline. My fault. Really? You wonder why? Well, I went public in 91. You know? And that's when Gilman came to me for his uh, $500,000. I think we generated about $25 million, uh, basically paid for the coin outside, which I was shutting down. I hired the for, a former president of Atari, and he joined my buddies in Europe and started a competing company. He walked to my office one day and said, you know, I'm going on vacation on Monday. You know, I said, well, how long have you gone? She only goes, oh, six months. What are you going for six months? To uh, Mark, uh, Martinburg, West Virginia, no, uh, somewhere in West Virginia. I said, what are you going to do there? He said, I'm going to jail. He had uh, blown some white stuff up his nose ah. after he got a $2 million bonus from Atari and didn't pay tax. He's going to stay over tax evasion. And he's the one that got me the coin out business. So I'm going, wow. And that was the same summer Sid and I decided to split up. 
That was 1989, I believe. And uh, Sid didn't want us to get any bigger. He didn't want us to get any bigger than my ex and he and I. That's who was doing it. Except the young lady I hired first ended up being his wife. So he wanted me to be at least that bigger. I heard, he like, I heard he liked to visit your basement quite a lot. Yeah, because of her. And they were married for like 20 years. They got a son together. And uh, Sid is hard to get along with. I mean, when he takes their dining room out, uh, furniture out, puts it in the garage, and put up seahorses in a plywood thing and builds Gettysburg in their dining room. That'll be a little tough. And Sid's son is evidently as brilliant as he is. I did give Sid the, uh, you know, I think it was something like the 1,742 uh, pages of the five years of the Civil War and for a Christmas gift. And I knew he was interested in that. And he gives it back to me on New Year's. And I said, Sid, why am I getting this back? I want to release. He said, oh, I memorized it. He memorized the whole damn book. That's wow. how smart he was. But he couldn't sell his way out of a wet paper basket. Okay. So that's why uh, I think it's perfect marriage. Sid was really creative and really smart, and I'm just a good go-getter. I don't quit. And I turned out to be a really good salesman in my flight suit being an idiot. <clears throat> but, hey, I enjoyed our games. I and made sure everybody else enjoyed them. And uh, I, I would go to train uh, to computer stores in a week and sit there in my flight suit and play Hellcat Ace, and everybody wanted to come on. I said, well, let me show you this chopper rescue. And how about Floyd in the Jungle? And I, I did that. I fly for the guard two weeks a month and do two weeks a month. So I'm working full time. I'm flying for the guard. I've got two kids and I'm doing microbrows. So it's a pretty busy time. So uh, we're talking about the end of microbrows. So I go public in 91. Yeah. It was a great event for us. We got rid of most of our debt. I got a little money on the side. But when I went public, the investment bankers wanted me to get some new board members. Mistake, mistake, mistake. Don't ever put financial people on the board. I'm going to have public board directors. I'm the chairman, and they decide I've been too hands-on. And let's be very clear, I'm very hands-on. I'd be in there early in the morning playing basketball with Bruce Shelley, who did Age of Empire. I used to knock Shelly up against the wall and, and, and play basketball because I'm pretty aggressive with that too. And I didn't mean to ever hurt him. So I'm on a bus in Dallas one time uh, and I look over and there's Bruce Shelly talking to somebody. He goes, he looks over and goes, well, don't hit me. <laughs> and it, I wasn't hitting him. I was just running into the wall trying to defend the, in the basketball game. And of course, he helps Sid with uh, civilization. He was like Sid's really uh, number two guy in that whole thing. And they went on to Age of Empires. So really another smart guy. Um, so they tell me I'm too hands-on. Okay. And let me come back to that story. because one more story I want to tell you. Okay. Uh, and come, come back to how what happened at the end of the night. So about 85... I'm the only one wearing tassel and loafers in the company, okay? Everybody else wearing tennis shoes or just some floppy shoes. So I'd go in the bathroom and, and they'd see my tassel and loafers under the, uh, the, when I'm sitting in the toilet, and they'd start complaining about their boss or complaining about somebody else in the company because they knew I was under there. <laughs> so they were talking to me without me talking back to them. So I'm, I'm, well, I'm not happy with this. So I get invited by my attorney at the time to go to a YPO uh, meeting. I don't know if you have any event like that in the UK. Young President's Organization. No, I don't, I don't think so. You gotta be president of a company by the time you're, uh, before you're 40, and you gotta have 50 employees or 500 million in revenues. Right. Or both. We had both. Not, uh, we didn't have, we had 5 million, not 50. Okay, 5 million. So I go to the first meeting, I tell them, I'm really upset about this. I can't go to the bathroom without people talking to me. He says, you know, ah, we've been there a long time ago. We all have our own bathrooms in our office. I go, wow, that's great. So I went and bought and the bathroom in my office. <laughs> and so I could go in there and read my book or something. Just leave me alone for a few minutes because I was there 12 hours a day. So let's go back to 91. We're doing great. We just went public, got plenty of money, and I've got eight games scheduled to come out in 92. 
They tell me I need to take a sabbatical and put somebody else in charge. Okay. I was kind of tired. It was the 11th year. And, and I'm ready to do something, just take a little break. And I get all these people want me to come to their universities who talk about entrepreneurship. I tell them it's just some people want to do it and some people aren't. And Ray Kroc, the guy who founded uh, McDonald's, failed like four or five times before he had McDonald's success. So I just never gave up. So I hired a very good guy, a friend of mine, uh, who graduated from our military academy. Now, if you have a military academy, Sandhurst is your Air Force academy, right? What's the military academy? Uh, Sandhurst is Army, isn't it? I thought it was. Mm. What's your military? What's your Air Force? You don't Do you know. know I don't know. Oh, okay, okay, is, don't it, know. is it Cranwell? Yes, I think it it's is Cranwell. Cranwell. Yes. Because I got a friend here at my mountain air place who wanted to go to Cranville and he was 6'5", so they turned him down. He couldn't now, fit we in had planes. Six, <laughs> well, he could have fit in an A-10, but you all didn't have any A-10s. So anyway, so I hired this guy, really good guy, friend of mine, golf friend of mine, and I go on my sabbatical and I talk at uh, all the big computer, uh, all the big colleges, their entrepreneur programs, their management programs, and I do 20 speeches. And I'm really enjoying it. And nobody's paying me, but I'm flying around the country. I've got plenty of money to do it. I'm going to tell you about Sid and I uh, splitting up either. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and uh, having a good time. He's supposed to have eight games ready to go on October 1st, 1992. I come back in September. I said, Are those games about ready to go? I want to test. It. And we're, we're a little bit behind. I'm going, I wonder what a little bit behind means. You know how many games were shipped in 92? I'm guessing not eight. And no. what was what date what date do you have to get them out? First of October. But guess what we put this one out? Strike Eagle 3. December 15th. I got 600 employees and no new products. That's a lot of money you're burning a month, isn't it? And I loved all our employees. Uh, only two of them I fired because they weren't nice to other people. But I caught one of them, well, three of them. One lied to me. One decided to take me on. And one, I came back. I was getting ready to go to come to England. And I forgot somebody. And uh, the car bring me back. And he's in the hallway like this with my VP of marketing yelling at him with his finger. That I fired him right there on the spot. Um, and then I made a mistake of taking one back and turned out he was doing drugs too. And I, I got a rule that I'd never take people back. If you want to leave me, go ahead. I'll wish you the best, but you don't come back because some reason you left in the first place. And I wish, I wish you the very best, but yeah. you're not coming back. So we had one game and I find that out on September 30th and I fire him that day. It was hurt me because he's my good friend. Yeah. And so I go about trying to figure out how I'm going to rescue the company. And I got a $14, $14 million loan from GE Capital. And then my accountant said, oh, we have to restate earnings. As a public company, restating earnings in the United States is death. Yeah. And they, they quit. I almost jumped off a building in May of 1993. Really? That bad? I had a $10 million uh, key man insurance. And if something happened to me, I'm drinking and standing on the ledge on the 27th floor, I could claim that was an accident. Um, I would, my company would survive. And my CFO talked me down. And uh, that's when I went to uh, the Ivy's Venture Capitalist who tried to buy us. And I negotiated with three different people to buy the company. And uh, Spectrum Holobyte had Pioneer Perkins as their venture fee. Spectrum Holobyte was $6 million at the time, and we were doing $45 million. But they wanted to be bigger, and they lent our company $10 million and put Gilman Louie in charge of Spectrum Holobyte. Your old friend. Yeah, and he's a good guy. Uh, uh, but they never did much other than Falcon. They did a very good job with Falcon. They, they, six million. Uh, it's an old neighbor too much. And I was on the board for about six months. I, and they kept telling me to be quiet. That's not the way they did it now. So I left the board. It was a heartbreak for me completely to have my company go down with me. doing so well. 
it was because of my bonus program, my friend, Mark, put them all on overtime. Do you know how much software gets done on overtime? Nothing on time. And that's what the problem was. He thought my bonus program made him work too hard. I said, they get inside out of the board. They want the bonus, they work on it. They don't yeah. want the bonus, they it easy. And uh, that's how I lost the company, by putting somebody else in charge. Looking it was back, very hurtful. Looking back, I can imagine. Looking back, what, what, what would you have done differently? I wouldn't have put the financial people on my board. I, uh, I wouldn't have gone into the coin out business if I had any sense. Right. Okay? But let's say I went to the coin out business, we got out of it. I had five coin outs in my garage, and somebody bought them from me about 10 years ago. He, he used to work for us. I tried to get him to come back and work for me because we're trying to. I, of course, I came to the Triangle Research Triangle here in North Carolina and started a second company and took it public and sold it. I sold one share of stock. I'm, and when I get off here, I'll be talking about that company with the guy who wants to sell me something today. But I think we could have done much better. Uh, we were on the roll. We had eight good products coming, and they only survived with those eight products until they all went out of business. I think we actually went out of business in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, I think but early 2000s, own, yeah. It was bought by Spectrum, a whole lot of Kleiner Perkins. Then it was bought by uh, Hasbro, and then it was bought by Infograms, which I think is the story. Is that right? I think so. I'd, it changed hands quite a bit, didn't it? Yep. Well, there was a company that was run by a bunch of gangsters, and they, they were negotiating with me, by venture capital was negotiating with me, and Spectrum uh, was negotiating. So Vino Caroso and I became very good friends. He was the principal of uh, Clyde Perkins. And he and I talked for six months on the phone with him trying to get to sell my stock for cheap, and they ended up finding a way to do that. So I ended up making you know a good return but it was nothing like when I, you know, my stock was worth $140 million. I didn't get anything close to that, for sure. Uh, and I've been living on it for 20 years. I haven't got a paycheck in 20 years. Wow. So, yeah, and now it's time for me to do something new. So at this advanced age of 39, okay, and... Uh, You're 39, uh, too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, let's see, it's the... 37th anniversary of my 39th birthday or something like that. 39th anniversary of my 39th birthday. I don't know where it is. 76 seems like a big number to me. But look at those sheets. <laughs> you Still got smiling. Too. Still smiling. <laughs> hey, you got, I got 17 grandbabies. And, uh, and let me show you where I live. Do you have time for that? Of course. Wow. You see, we're at the top of the mountain just in western North Carolina. We got a runway to golf course, two things I like. This is on my back porch. That is beautiful. And, and this is our golf course. This is what the runway looks like when I try to land there. Wow. It's our club clubhouse, got two restaurants, workout facility, and a lot of nice people, but a lot of very wealthy people. We're at the bottom of that stack. Oh well. Uh, at least you're in the stack. Well, we were in here. If I don't do something quick, we're not gonna be here. But, yeah. you know, we go back to Florida for half the year. You've seen pictures of my airplane, I'm sure. I right? have. Have you still you, got that? that? Was a, no, I've had three heart attacks, man. Ah. They kind of frowned at me. be up there flying a missile around when you get heart attacks. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun in the Miss Mike Pros. We got a lot of reviews because of the Miss Mike Pros, too. What? So, were, there, were there any games that you wanted making that just never came about for technical reasons or otherwise? No, so I like taking each one of my games and making three copies of them. I want to make them better each year. And of course, I'm still running a game called Warbirds that's generated over 50 million bucks for us over the years. Yeah. And I need to update that with uh, Unreal 5. And I don't know if you know who Epic Games is. I'm sure I you do. do, right? Yeah. They, they just laid off 800 people. I don't, I don't know a great deal about Epic Games. My son is a big PC gamer. Um... Well, that's uh, the Unreal Engine, which is one of the best uh, graphic systems. And they had like 3,000 employees in my town. They actually followed me from Baltimore. 
to here to sell themselves to me. And my VP of development said, well, they don't have anything. They didn't even bring it to me. He just told me this later. Thanks, they're a $6 billion company and I'm too big to fill. So, and then I got interviewed one time when a newspaper asked me if I was related to billion dollar bill. I said, yeah, it was a dollar ninety eight bill. Come on. So, I think but, you did yourself we had a, a bit of an injustice there. <laughs> well, we had we've had great fun. The soccer team cost me five million dollars. We came and we played Sheffield Wednesday and we played Aston Villa. Oh, really? And we kicked, kicked their butts in front of twenty thousand people in the arena because it was indoor soccer. And our game was you got two points for a goal, three points for a really good goal. And if a goalie fouled you going in, you got one on one like a basketball free shot. And we were down 21 to 11 with a minute 40 to go and won the game. How about that? <laughs> That's some fast three point shots. That's all we came down to it. We got three of them in. Working under pressure. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, but we had great fun. We actually. Brought uh, six guys from Red Star Belgrade, and we brought a, whole, a couple of Englishmen too. And they all seemed to have uh, new babies coming within six months. They didn't want to go home, especially the guys in the Coast of All War. They didn't want to go home. So, pretty amazing. But so, Microsoft, I had, Microsoft is still going in some way, shape, or form, isn't it? Michael Pros, you Ma said Michael Pros. Sorry, yes. I got Bill Gates one of his very first dates. Let me be very clear. He did a speech at the software publisher, and I'm sitting there with a couple of our marketing people and two good-looking girls. And I said, you girls think they'll talk. That's a billion-dollar bill. I said, he's a nerd. He's got a pocket take and a pencil. And I said, come on, girls. I want to go introduce you. Because he just done a speech and was over all our heads. Right. And I go over to interesting the two girls, and he sits there and chats them up. He's so excited somebody I'm talking to him. He was sitting by himself with a booth, and we're all sitting there having a good time. So I just decided to give him a date. So there you go. Um, what was your question? I forgot. Microprose, they still go. The somebody else is now running with the name. No, no, I, I'm I'm friends with, and I just got a text from him this morning. From David Leggetti. he was a fan boy. Yeah, he loved all our games. Uh, and he shows me he's got most all of them left there. And uh, we started talking, and he's a good guy, but he had built himself his own cockpit. So he was a teenager. And he went into air conditioning. But then he went into a defense business because he started making a simulation product in the defense business. He sells to defense people all around the world. And after that, he said he's going to go in again. He started buying all the uh, old licenses he could. Microprose. He, he redid the B-17 game recently. I think he's got about 13 games out right now. He actually invited my wife and I to come to Australia. We went there four years ago and I was helping him out for a couple of years and he didn't, didn't like me criticizing some of his games. But now we're, we're still friends uh, and he and I are talking about doing something together. We'll see. Because I'd love to have him take our... We've got 50 games, many of them just like Microprose games. And... Uh, I'd like him to redo them and launch something and make the stock, which is traded for pennies, uh, be worth a dollar. Is is that is that we're a public company? We're a public company. Is that reinventing the games and doing them in a new style, or is this very much? I want to take first. I want to take them and update the graphics and the UI because they all still play good. Yeah. And then we'll make new versions of. Them. But I think we can do all that for less than a hundred thousand dollars a game. And each game will make us a million. I think that's a pretty good return. The gameplay themselves is is timeless, isn't it? It's the graphics that move on. Yeah. That's why my Warbirds game is the very best simulation game out there for flying, other than the Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's not Microsoft even anymore. Or was not I think they bought it back. I don't know what the deal is there. And uh, But we're the only one that can have a 1,000 players online at the same time fighting each other. Yeah. That was a patent we owned. We owned a patent on this uh, from a company I bought. And uh, we sold that to Microsoft for $200,000, which helped us keep the company alive. So I've taken lots of little investment, but we need to raise real money right now. And that's what I'm trying to do. And then you'll get to see me on TV more. I'll be cheering and yelling, go, go, go. You just, <laughs> I don't think I'm... I you don't, just haven't I stopped, have you? Uh, why stop? Uh, and uh, but I don't think I'll fit my flight suits anymore. 
So tell us, what is it that you're doing now then? Because you're still in the games industry, aren't you? I'm, I'm trying to raise money now. Um, and with this layoff at Epic, which is where my company really is headquartered, I'm looking at a couple of those guys. If we can raise $3 million, we'll go from almost zero to $27 million in three years. It's what I did before. I've done it twice before successfully. Yeah. I want to do it one more time. But I got to find some real investors who want a penny stock that I'll make a dollar in three years. Uh, but nobody wants to give money to a 76 year old guy who has heart problems. So I got to find some young person uh, to come over and run the company. You available? <laughs> you if, if, you class, the US... if you class me as young, uh, how old are you, Simon? judgment isn't as good as what I thought. Well, I can't see. <laughs> uh, how old are you, Simon? I'm 50. <laughs> That's young compared to me. Wow. And lots of 50 year olds still get funding. But I, I'm I'm talking to a couple guys from Epic right now. And because we have to go out and they've got to put the pitch together. I have a pitch. I think I sent you a copy of it. You did. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do China 2027 and I'm gonna do an a esports game where we're gonna race like they race uh, drones and and like the uh, the guys that go go around Europe used to, the uh, Red Bull. Yeah. And we're going to do that, but people are going to be shooting at you. And you got to drop bombs and destroy them to win the race. <laughs> so we've done that already in the game. And we have pretty much fun, but I got to get it uh, in a big way. But I can't do it because I'm doing customer service, marketing, finance. And I got a CTO that's fixing things, and I'm not the CTO. One thing that my son is absolutely, I mean, he's at university now studying uh, software engineering. But one thing, I mean, he's been massively into games since since he was that big. Um, I'm not saying I influenced him, um, <laughs> but it's it the playing games in VR. Have you have you have you played have you played on on like the PlayStation stuff like that with or uh, or the Oculus with the headsets? I did 1985 in your famous square downtown London. 85? 1985. Wow. Do you want to hear about it? What's that, sorry? I said uh, somebody had done a VR game and it was, uh, it, you had to stay in this little cage and uh, you, you had a thing and they put all these characters up and you had to shoot them down. It was 1985. And it's right downtown where the famous statue is, and they had a game, like point out game place there. And uh, that's where I did it, and we had a great time doing that. Uh, and uh, that was done in 1985. But I have not played it recently, and I probably need to, because I'm busy playing my Warbirds and a couple other of my games. And I was going to show you uh, one when I got my kids into it. Uh, here, let me see if I make this a little bit bigger. I'll be sure if we're not good talking. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, this is not a very good picture, but I'm going to show it to you. I, I, I've got to get a better one. This is a game done in, in Europe. Yeah. And we brought it. That's my son. That's my daughter. And this is my uh, 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 secretary's son. Awesome. It's a, uh, and we did micro soft. Uh, see, it says medalist international. That's us. Yeah. So, my uh, he's been helping with games since he was like. So, Sid did Floyd in the Jungle because we had an Atari 800 and I had three kids. So we'd all play Floyd in the Jungle together and shoot each other down. And then we started playing uh, a couple of this, Civilization. And since we only had three computers. Uh, then they'd have to. Uh, if anybody went to the bathroom, they lost their spot. I'm trying to find Bill Jr. here. He's he's standing with me when I'm. Oh, here it is. So we got this one. Can you see that one? I do. There's John Jr. John right there. He's ten years old. Fabulous. That's so it's all by that. And now he's as big as I am, and he's got three kids for me, and I got a grandson. Uh, let's see, I got Sid and I here someplace. What is this one? I think that's Sid and I. Yeah. 
And I got one more signal that's even better than I thought. Well, uh, oh, yeah. oh, I almost had it. What do you think of this? Now, that's the only time I ever saw Sid in a suit. Let's be very clear. <laughs> Sid didn't wear suits. I told him we're going to go see the investment banker. You see, I, I can wear a, a tie, and I, that was my IBM look. I've never because seen I, pictures of Sid in a suit. Well, it didn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> but he's smart as a whip. I uh, split up. I paid him a bunch of millions. And he kept his salary and he kept 15% of the games he did after that. We still worked together and he was there when I left. And we were still friends, but he didn't want to be responsible for any of the debts. Like he didn't want to hock his car when I hocked mine. So, and I, in fact, I used to have to go and take his paychecks off the top of the refrigerator. He didn't ever turn them in. He didn't need to. He was getting paid by, uh, you know, General <laughs> Insulin. For his other job. He, he had another job. But, you know, you ask about the name of the company. And his user group was called the Smuggers. You've heard that, right? I've heard that. Yeah. Sid Meier's user group. We didn't think they'd go for a company. Smoke until we got <laughs> uh, And I've had a bunch of the old guys from the industry uh, that knew I was having some health issues. And they uh, have been contacting me really sleep tell. Let's all get together in Florida and have a blowout. I said, as long as we can walk afterwards, we'll see. The guy who did one of the original role play games just talked to me last week. Uh, got a name like Sergeant or General or something. I don't remember what his game was, but you know, we, we just still get together and shoot the breeze very hard. Yeah. I haven't seen him in about four years. Ah. I used to go up there uh, all the time we play golf, and we were there. I remember my wife and I were there a number of, a number of years ago, and uh, uh, we played golf and we went to dinner and all that stuff. And it was because his wife, he was getting some kind of award there from a, a game museum they had there in Baltimore Harbor. And, they, and I got to go and see some of the old team. And this is why I was aggravated at my wife here. I'm sure it'd be like, I don't know. Let's get things going. There you go. She looks better in a flight suit than I did. See you there? My chair is great. No, no, yeah. Oh, well. I gotta keep remembering to do that, don't I? She looks better in a flight suit than I did. <laughs> it's really not fair. But we had such a great time uh, flying together. She had about 1,800 hours at least in my airplane. Let's see if this one will well. This is when we first started dating. Awesome. Yeah, we had a great time. It's our 25th anniversary next week. Well, congratulations. Yeah, I'm surprised she still puts up with it. I'm paying the butt. Really? She gets, it, well, I've had 15 operations. She said, slept in a hospital in a recliner at least 15 times, and sometimes two or three days. So she's a real keeper. Good. And she brought, she brought me three Jones children that I like all of them very much. They're too busy to talk to me very often, but they talk to her all the time. But uh, it worked out good. And has F 15 just been sitting there flying the whole time? You've been talking? It's it's just it's just sat there waiting to take off. Well, sometimes check out our Coin out machine. Have you seen Don't pictures you of that? The brakes off. Yeah. You, uh, is that F 19? Is that F 19? That's F 19, yeah. Of, of all the seen, games, you, absolutely my favorite. Did you, yes. Did you see the, uh, the coin out game we did? I didn't ever see that. I didn't know you'd done one. Can I show it to you? Absolutely. And this is a lot of fun. I was back there testing these all the time, too. And uh, it's really F-15 strike ego in the corner out there. And what's your famous square down there? Look at that. I have never seen that. And uh, I think I've got a couple more for you. Wow, that looks cool. Yeah, that looks cool. 
is very cool. Look at that joystick, man. And this was sitting in your famous place down at some big square. I think it's where the big statue is, where a lot of theaters are downtown London. Where's that? Oh, um, doesn't oh, matter, but there's the name's escaping now. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of fun. That cost me $12 million. We sold $12 million worth, and of course, we had more expenses than really because we had people and all that stuff. So, so you were net zero on that then? I think we minus $2 million to get. So, another mistake. Well, and somebody, somebody was counting all my mistakes the other day when we were sitting there talking about it. I said, well, Bill, that's six. I said, it's a good thing I've come, made a couple of good moves, too. <laughs> that's hard to hear with Sid to begin with. Well, Did I answer all your questions, Simon? You, you, you've you answered more than my questions. I, I, I can't thank you enough for giving giving up your time. Uh, it's, it's very much appreciated. Wow, what a fabulous guy. And I'm sure you'll agree, an absolute gentleman. I hope you enjoyed that. It was quite a long video. If you've got to the end, then well done. I didn't want to edit it very much because what I found to be interesting and what you found to be interesting may be two different things, and I didn't want to cut anything out. I'm sure you'll join me in wishing Bill good health and success with his latest venture. I've also included uh, in the description below uh, a link to Warbirds, which you can have a look at and play on Steam. He's not asked me to include that. That's just something that I've done because I've downloaded it and started playing it, and I'm really getting into it, and perhaps you'll enjoy it too. I've also included in the video description a link for a recent video from RMC where they did a feature on microprose and one thing that I found quite interesting listening to Bill when I've asked him about software piracy is people bin diving and you'll see that links in quite well so thank you for watching uh, if you've liked it thumbs up or subscribe perhaps do something similar again in the future Maybe if you've got some questions that I didn't ask, I can always put these to Bill and maybe yeah, we can do something again in the future. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Uh, take care and bye for now.